If we see that Lazarus coming back to life is the good news here this morning, we've missed it because there's something way better that Jesus is revealing in this resurrection. And so while the crowds all see that Jesus has resurrected Lazarus, only his own see and know the glory of God. Let's read verse 30 uh, again. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they found Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary's words are the identical words to Martha's first words to Jesus. Lord, if you had been here. But she is far more emotional and she is surrounded by those who had come to mourn with her. Jewish custom of the day uh, dictated that there would be professional mourners included in the procession. Even a poor family uh, was expected to hire at least a couple of flute players and a professional wailing woman. Can you imagine that's your job? Funeral to funeral, wailing. Lazarus is from what seems to be quite a prominent and wealthy family and likely had quite a bit of professional grief in attendance. And so Jesus responds to this wailing and grief and Mary's emotional throwing herself down and crying out to him. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man also have kept this man from dying? There's an easy misunderstanding to make here regarding the meaning of Jesus being deeply moved. It has a very specific meaning in the original Greek, but even a careful reading of John's gospel should have us fairly suspicious of sharing any of the same conclusions as the Jewish crowd. All through the Gospel of John, the Jews' response to Jesus always indicates that they have misunderstood him. And even if they do say the right thing, it's for the wrong reasons, or they mean something other than what would be accurate. So deep, the, the understanding of what this means that Jesus was deeply moved is going to form how we interpret this passage this morning. But what I want to show you is that if we're carefully reading John and going through verse by verse, we're actually going to right away have a little bit of a suspicion if we're agreeing with the crowd. Because all the way up till now, the crowd has never been intentionally right. And so when the crowd says, see how he loved him, And could not he be the uh, the one who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? We should probably not have the same conclusions as the crowd. They misunderstand Jesus' grief. See how he loved him. But once we get to the end of the story, it makes absolutely no sense to think that Jesus was weeping over Lazarus' death. Since we know that he was about to raise him from the dead, Not only that, but Jesus has very calmly informed his disciples and now Martha that he has allowed Lazarus to die in order that the glory of God would be revealed in his resurrection. So Jesus has been very cavalier about death up to this point. Yes, I'm waiting for your sake so that Lazarus would die so that the glory of God would be revealed. Jesus has a very candid conversation with Martha and even though her brother has just died, Jesus does not wail with her but has a theological discussion leading her to faith and promising something far greater than she's ever seen before. And so Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. Now this was one of my favorite memory verses in Sunday school and Bible college, um, solely because it is the shortest verse in the English Bible. And so I, I would, every time we had to memorize a certain number of verses, pick that one out. But if we really understand the reason for Jesus' gr- deep grief, other than some trite pretension in pretending to grieve with this family, then we will have begun to understand the purpose of our passage this morning. In order for us to comprehend Jesus' 
response to Mary's weeping and that of her entourage, we need to understand the term our translators have rendered deeply moved. Now, more literally translated, this word refers to the sharp snorting of a horse. When, you know, like when a horse is indignant because you've brushed her the wrong way? You've never done that, but I have. You know how horses, they don't, they don't get mad. They might try to bite you, but not the nice ones. But if you do something around them that isn't the way it's supposed to be done, they give you that harumph of like, what do you think you're doing? It, it, whenever this word is applied to human beings, like literally every time in Greek, when this is applied to human beings, it always speaks of anger, outrage, or emotional indignation. This isn't guesswork here this morning. This is the meaning of this Greek word in Jesus' context. It's saying he was angry, indignant, or outraged. So it's not as though Jesus literally snorted or growled, but the term means that he was deeply moved to outrage in his spirit. And it says, in addition, he was greatly troubled. And so at what then was Jesus so angry? If the word to describe Jesus' mood is the snor- angry snorting of a horse, what has got him upset? Now, Jesus may have been moved by their grief and then moved to anger over the fallen state of the world, sin, and the sickness and death it inflicts, the sorrow inherent to living in such a world afflicted. But if sin illness and death, all devastating features of this fallen world, excite his wrath, it is hard to see how unbelief is excluded. That particular part of the fallen social order is what Jesus is directly responding to in his anger. It's the unbelief evident in their weeping. Martha, in that conversation, she had held herself together. Uh, Comforting herself with what? The, the sure hope of a future resurrection. And she was then led by Christ to an increased faith in a current confidence for spiritual life in him. But this mob of mourners led by Mary, who falls at his feet in desperate grief, has moved him to indignation. Believing men and women... Do not grieve like pagans with the wailing despair that pours out its loss as if there were no resurrection. That would be an implicit implicit denial of that resurrection. To grieve as though there is no future life is to deny the faith. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that is, have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. When they come to Lazarus' funeral and they have the professional wailers and the family wails along with them and Mary, overly emotional, throws herself down at the feet in desperate grief, and all of these others with her in their their funeral uh, weeping and wailing, Jesus' response is indignant. He's outraged at this response of theirs. If they have a true hope in the resurrection, and Martha serves as the... uh, juxtaposition to this, or or she serves as the one who does this right, so we see how these have done it wrong. Uh, She knows the hope and is not wailing. They have forgotten their hope and wail. The same thing, and I believe this is where the Holy Spirit is speaking to us on this morning, just because of of my knowledge of where we are at. The same thing is regarding our worry. When we grieve unrestrained in our weeping and become totally despaired, we deny the fact of the future resurrection. If I have lost my loved one permanently, there is no hope. But if I've only been separated from my loved one for a time, I can still myself with that. There is much grief still, but it is not the same despairing grief of those who have no hope. The same also applies to the way that we worry. 
when we worry in uh, breaking, in rebellion to the command of Christ, breaking his command not to worry, but to trust in God, we deny the reality of God's providence and care for us. If we live in anxiety and we continue to give ourselves over to this despair, we have denied the work of Christ. It's not as though we have no concerns. It's not as though we haven't things to deal with and things to worry about and things to pray about. It just as the same as Christians still have real grief at a funeral, but that grief is not overwhelming. It does not lead to despair. Neither should our worry be despairing and lead to anxiety, but we can cast our cares on him. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is that we have many things that should cause us anxiety. But there's a peace of God which surpasses the context. There's a peace of God that overwhelms the concern. There's a peace of God knowing that he is the one who is our hope and is our salvation. So we are to be anxious about nothing, but having brought it to God with thanksgiving. This is key. Even as we share with God all of the concerns that we have in our lives, even as we think about all of the things that we need so desperately and the broken relationships and the lack of funds and and whatever it is that weighs upon us this morning, if we bring these things to God, laying them at his feet, also with thanksgiving, knowing that the far more important things have been cared for by him already we will be transformed in our thinking. We become those who are so inner-focused when we are always worried about the things that are happening in our lives. We struggle to care for the needs of others. We struggle to be those who are boldly proclaiming the gospel to others when we are wrapped up in our own needs and concerns. And so as we lay these at Christ's feet with thanksgiving that he has won our salvation, with thanksgiving that he has granted us every heavenly blessing in Christ Jesus, then we can work for him. Luke 12, 32 is one of the most amazing promises, and it's said in a way almost to children, and but we need this promise this morning. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In our time of worry and anxiety, Will we remind ourselves of this promise? Fear not. Fear not, church. It's your Father's good will. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so just like those here who mourn uncontrollably, not in faith, we sometimes are those who walk in worry, uncontrolled, and lacking faith. Jesus always does what pleases the Father. And he is indignant when these people who call themselves God's own people ignore the truths that God himself has revealed. When their true beliefs are exposed, they are shown to have the same inner thoughts the same value systems, the same worries as fallen society in conflict with its creator. But the world that is at enmity with God, that is, is, is his enemy, is also the object of God's love. So it is not surprising that when he was shown the tomb where the body lay, Jesus also wept. The same sin and death, the same unbelief that prompted his outrage also generates his grief. Verse 35, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. 
But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. Jesus' display of emotion is interpreted in two ways by the Jews. And both interpretations are ironically both right and wrong. Some of them understand Jesus' tears to be for Lazarus, a demonstration of how much he loved him. And their conclusion is true. Jesus did love Lazarus and his sisters deeply, but his tears could not have meant what they understood them to mean because they understood his grief to be as despairing as their own. They are weeping. Now Jesus is weeping. He must be weeping for the same reason we are. Jesus' tears instead are for their unbelief. And his response to their speculation in verse 38, again, is righteous indignation. Others remember the man born blind. Remember that they are from Jerusalem where the miracle had taken place. And they wonder why someone who could perform such an amazing miracle as opening the eyes of a man born blind could fail the people he cares about so badly. How could he who has this power let Lazarus die of illness? They show the kind of false false faith we've seen throughout the Gospel of John. Those who are looking for a sign and having seen one, then start looking for the next one. They demand new signs and miracles throughout John's Gospel. And it is evidence of this unbelief to which Jesus' response again is quiet outrage. Jesus doesn't lose his cool, he doesn't fly off the handle, but his disciples record that he was outraged, indignant, angry. Three times Jesus here has a strong emotional response. Each time he has a strong emotion and does not sin, but does exactly what he should in righteousness. Jesus' emotional responses here teach us a lot about who God is and how he responds to our sin of unbelief, how he responds to our sin of anxiety and worry. These things will teach us about how God cares for us in our trial. But Jesus is also our perfect example of how to live righteously, our exemplar, who shows us how we should live and respond to the state of this fallen world. And so there's two things I want to look at here in Jesus' emotional response. One, what we know about God, and two, what this teaches us that we are to do in Christ. I want to tell you a couple of stories this morning. Courtney and I um, were filled with anxiety recently. We were, I was speaking the right words, but having the, right, the wrong feelings. I, I was not trusting that God would be compassionate to us. I was not trusting that God would care for us in our circumstance. I, I have no problem like Mary saying, someday it'll all be okay, but I have a, a very hard time to think of my good Heavenly Father as loving and compassionate. Sometimes my, in, in my sinful thinking, I think of Him as a hard Father. And we were walking in this anxiety and worry about how things were working out. We considered, continued to want certain outcomes but not see how they could possibly happen. And while, while we lacked belief and trust in God, we were brought to a point of, of prayer. And we put our need before God and we asked for uh, a very specific outcome in a very specific way. We asked God, would you do this? And the very next day, in just the most amazing way, uh, this exact thing that we had asked for, asking God for this supply and this need, uh, came through in, in a way we could not have predicted or expected. God would be so truly indignant and outraged at the lack of faith that we show. And at the same time, his mercy and compassion for us is that what, when we need to know the loving kindness of our Heavenly Father, he cares for us. So Jesus, outraged at their sin of unbelief, that at their failure to put faith in the work God would do, at the same time weeps 
for them, has compassion over them, and then he brings about the miraculous so that what they are weeping about is cured. He cares about their situation. Christ reveals the love of God in his grief. But it's not some useless, merely sentimental love that lacks the courage and lacks the outrage and lacks the wherewithal to take drastic action regarding sin. So while God, when he sees us weeping in our sin, when he sees us built up in in anxiety and, and worry and unable to be at peace, he has these two responses to us. Jesus shows us this. His outrage is real. It is ridiculous that we would lack faith having seen so much that God has done for us, and yet that is the case with me. It's ridiculous that we would have worry knowing that every heavenly blessing is ours in Christ Jesus and that we have a good and loving heavenly Father who is in control of the universe. How, how silly, how foolish. And I just keep on having that picture of that horse that I messed with one time in, <laughs> when I was young that just gave that big shuddering snort that knew, okay, I'm, I'm back, whatever you didn't like. I won't do that again. You know what I've said? Because he is powerful and he is strong and he is not safe. And God has this indignant outrage at our lack of faith. And at the same time, his compassion for us, his mercy, is that he weeps with us. He cares as much as we do over our situation. I want you to think for a second of the things or the thing that you have been worried about and had anxiety over. From a divine perspective, how big of a problem is that? From what we have been revealed, from what has been revealed to us in Scripture, the goodness of God, His providence and control, his absolute plan to work all things out for our good and his glory if we are those who love him and are called according to his purpose. How significant is your problem with that biblical perspective? Now imagine God's indignance that we would show this lack of faith and trust in our worry and at the same time His love for us is so extreme that he weeps with us, weeps for us in our circumstance, cares deeply for our circumstance. And so on one hand, with just the one, you can say our problems are trite. And at the same time, the God who to him truly our problems are trite, he lowers himself to our situation, our perspective, and says, even though in my mind your problems are completely trite, I grieve with you. I care about you. I love you. Your grief is my grief. Jesus wept. So Jesus shows us who God is here. Secondly, Jesus is our perfect example. Even in his emotions, he shows us exactly how our emotions should be handled. He shows us the kind of emotions that we should have in this circumstance. He shows us a a combination response to sin and unbelief. His combination emotional response, both anger and grieving compassion. All Christ's disciples must learn that same tension. Our own anger at sin must be tempered by grief. Outrage without grief hardens into self-righteous arrogance and a short-tempered attitude. I want to tell you one more story this morning. I grew up going to a, a kind of a church. I sometimes don't know whether to call it a cult or a church. It was a, a prosperity, word of faith, uh, abusive system. And when I became a Christian and looked at this false teaching, my anger burned 
against the false teachers who had misled us and continue to mislead many of my friends and family. I had a, a real indignance, and I would say a righteous indignance, against this sin of false teaching that would so entrap and abuse people. But my anger at false teachers was turned by God to a deep grief over sin, theirs and mine. God showed me that the sin of false teaching was no greater than my sin of wanting to hear false teaching and being the one who had my itching ears scratched by whatever I wanted to hear. And so now, both at the same time, I am angry at false teaching, indignant. But God, in his mercy, has kept me from being burning up in that, kept me from being constantly uh, angry and self-righteous and uh, short-tempered, and brought me to the place where I mourn our collective rebellion against God. And I'm, I'm telling you from experience, this is a, a far more pleasant, uh, a far uh, more um, life-affirming response than purely anger alone. It is okay to be angry about sin. But let Jesus be our example that while he was so angry about sin, he also was in deep grief over their sin, that they had been so affected and showed so little faithfulness to God. And so by all means, when we see injustice, when we see people treated wrong, when we see people flaunting the rebellion against God, let us have indignance against the sin and rebellion. But let us also be those who have the compassion And in response to Christ's compassion for us, show compassion to others in mourning their sin, grieving with them when even unfaithfulness and unbelief have brought them to that grief. Let us share these dual responses with Christ, even when it comes to our emotions. Anger at false teaching. Anger at mistreating people. Anger at those who rob, kill, and steal. Anger at those who abuse. And yet, at the same time, see how sin has affected us all and mourn our corporate rebellion against God. I want to end with Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Thanks be to Christ Jesus, who has become like us in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to lay his life down as a sacrifice on our behalf, our substitution, that we might share in a heavenly calling with him and our brothers and sisters in Christ, the assembly of believers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would teach us and apply it to us by your Spirit. Let us not be hearers only, but doers of your word. Christ, we thank you, first of all, for who you are and how what you do so perfectly represents who you are that we can worship you and enjoy you both for who you are and what you have done. We give you praise. Jesus, I am moved this morning by the love you show that even while in your holiness you are righteously indignant at our sin of unbelief, you also weep over us, caring deeply for our every need and situation. We give you praise. May we each grow in our love for you, falling further in love with you as we see the way in which you respond to your people here in this passage. We ought to respond correctly to every sin in every situation, and we do not. We even allow ourselves to become cold to the, towards those who are in sin and sinning. We allow ours to be, ourselves to be judges with evil thoughts, 
writing them off. Give us your mercy and your grace. We who can't even see into the heart of man and see the true wickedness and evil that lies beneath their actions can learn from the way that you have responded to us that while you hated, while you saw our sin and were so revolted, while you are indignant and outraged over our sin of unbelief, that you love us and you're mercifully compassionate. For this we give you praise. In Jesus' name.